Yes, sir. That's the least amount of talking you've done, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> it is the least amount of talking you've ever done. <laughs> and I've only known you for a day. My name is Jason. I'm an alcoholic. I sober day only by the grace of God and the solution I found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to thank Sherry for inviting me. I don't, oh, there she is. I thought she left. Um, you know, when you call Sherry, she, I called her to check in for something, and she's like, who's covering your group? I was like, what the heck is that supposed to mean? You know what I mean? Luckily, I had a group that I was supposed to be doing, but I had somebody covering it. But I was trying to figure out how she knew that. Um, but it's been a privilege to be here. You know, uh, there was a young man sitting over there that took a year and I watched his family cry. You know, and when you see that, that's why I go to Alcoholics Anonymous today, is to see the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous, to see the miracle of recovery. You know, I'm the kind of guy that when I drink, I don't stop till I run out or pass out. And if I put something else in my body, I don't stop till I get caught. Um, I'm just that kind of guy. You know, I, uh, I got roped into Alcoholics Anonymous like on an uh, accident, and we'll get to that. But, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life. Everything that I have, it's a value or any good. Or anything at my house. If you went to my house and you lifted up everything and looked on the bottom, it's just say property of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> it really should because everything I have is from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I understand. And when you hear my story, you're going to say, Gigi, I think you're an addict, Jason. But uh, Alcoholics Anonymous gave me some principles, gave me some steps, gave me some structure, and gave me some love. And today, that's why I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, sometimes I'm in good standing. It just depends on if you're talking to my sponsor or my wife. Yeah. <laughs> One time I gave a talk like this, and on the way home, my wife said, I sure wish that guy in the last 20 minutes of your talk went home with us. And uh, <laughs> it ain't that funny. You know, uh, hey, man, almighty. I have a home group back in Oregon. I'm from Portland, Oregon, or Happy Valley, Oregon. Every, and then we don't smoke a lot of pot there. That's, every time somebody says you're from Happy Valley, it automatically says we smoke pot. We're like the conservative people in that area. The hippies live down below. Um, like my mom. Um, you know, I have a home group there. We meet every Wednesday. It's a men's group. It's a lunch bunch. They have six meetings a week there, but the Wednesday group is a men's group, and I'm there. I have a service commitment there. I'm the assistant garbage taker-outer. I was the garbage guy, and uh, I missed a business meeting. I got voted down. The guy with 30 days has my job. So what I do is I follow him around to make sure he takes the garbage out. And uh, really, it's a great job, if you really think about it. I ran for treasure. Never got that. And... Uh, and I don't want to do anything else. Um, you know, I, uh, I have a sponsor, and, and I'm going to share with you how I got my sponsor, and then you can take from this story how you should judge this talk. Um, so I had been coming to Alcoholics Anonymous for like about three years, and uh, I was on a dry drunk, I guess is what you would call it. I was going to one meeting a month. It was a speaker's meeting, and I was on the raffle committee. And the only reason I went is because I got half the money. And uh, it wasn't until I got a sponsor I had to get that half back. But... Uh, you know, I, that's all I did. And, you know, there was this guy there that I just couldn't stand. He was like, I thought he was the president of AA. And he had all these guys that followed him around everywhere they go. You know, uh, I call them not -agains. Some people call them sponsors. Some call them ducklings. Some people call them pigeons, whatever. I call them not -agains because they're always standing at the door wanting to greet you. They always talk about God, talk about the solution, talk about the big book. And you're just going, God, not again. You know what I mean? And they're always there. And there's like, there's like 10 or 15 of them. And if he goes right, they go right. You know, and they just annoyed me. And uh, so <clears throat> when you're going to one meeting a month, you're, you're really living a good life. And, uh, <laughs> and so it was this Saturday of the meeting, and I got in an argument with my wife, and I asked her for a divorce, and she said no. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know that was an option, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I, uh, I gave her some more of my opinions, and she goes, well, I'm going to the meeting. Maybe you should go. You're the raffle chair. And the first thing I thought is that there's money there, but I'm not going. And so uh, she took off to go to the meeting, and I went into my daughter's room, which is the office, and uh, I wrote a resignation letter to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? I, uh, it's not, I'm not proud of it. But I got the big book, and I got the Bible, and I typed this stuff up, and I'm not very good at it. And I dated it and signed it, and I put it in an envelope, and I went to the meeting to resign from Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, Yeah. It's even worse when I tell this story when my sponsor's in here because he's like, ah, he starts laughing now. So needless to say, there's this John guy, and he's standing there, and, you know, he's greeting, and everybody's doing what they're doing. And, and I'm kind of in a bad mood, so I walk up, and I hand him the letter, and he takes it out, and he starts reading it, and then he just starts laughing, like Disneyland laughing loud, like loud laughing. And he had gold teeth at the time, and it's just, it's just everybody's looking at us, and I'm sweating, and then all of a sudden he says no. 
And I said, what do you mean, no? He says, I'm not going to let you quit Alcoholics Anonymous. And what accidentally came out of my mouth was, well, will you sponsor me then? And uh, when I did that, he wasn't laughing anymore. You know what I mean? He, just, he got serious just like that. You know what I mean? And he said, uh, are you willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol? I'm thinking to myself, I just asked you to be my sponsor. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? He goes, I'm going to give you five directions. If you want to take these five directions, I'll sponsor you. And I said, well, you know, John, there's no directions in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all suggestions. He says, I'm going to give you these five directions. If you don't want to do them, I'm suggest you find somebody else. You know what I mean? And I said, all right. So he told me I had to pray twice a day on my knees. And I had to say, I had to get on my knees in the morning. I had to say, please help. Thank you. Amen. And if I got on my, <clears throat> made it sober through that day, I had to get on my knees and say thanks. You know, and uh, he said, don't say any more to God. I've heard you share in meetings. You'll be trying to con him. That's all you need to say. <laughs> and I was like, he didn't even ask me if I believed in God. He just told me how to pray. He said I had to call him every day. Monday through Friday at 6.02 in the morning. I was like, why? But I said, okay. You know what I mean? And then he told me I had to read two pages out of the big book for the rest of my life after we went through the big book together. And I was like, this guy's getting out of hand. <laughs> but the deal breaker was almost right here. He said I had to go to five meetings a week to where he was at. I was like, in one week, five meetings? And he's like, yeah. I was like, that's like almost a six-month coin. You know what I mean? <laughs> Gee, many Georges. But... I said, okay, and he said, and try not to drink in between those meetings. If you're willing to do that, I'm willing to walk to the gates of hell with you. And, and, and I drug that guy to the gates of hell with me, and he stayed with me. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm truly grateful for that. I wish I, I'd like to say that, man, so there's, they say in my home group, there's two kinds of people in AA, those who show you what to do and those who show you what not to do, and they're both equally as important. And sometimes I'm that guy that just does not drink. You know what I mean? I, some days I don't do alcoholics, and I'm as good as anybody, but then some days I can be right on as anybody. You know, and I've learned that that's okay. Um, I should probably start drinking. Um, you know, I've been praying for sunshine for like four days, and I put a suit on, and the sunshine came out, and it's like, God, I wish it was cloudy and raining. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, my mom and dad got divorced when I was like two or three years old. My dad uh, took off. I never saw him again for quite a while. My mom was an old hippie. Uh, this was like probably the early 70s, and... Uh, as being an old hippie, sometimes we lived in the back of a, a truck. Sometimes we lived in a teepee. Sometimes we lived out in the woods in a cabin. You know, stuff, there was people coming in, people going out. There's a lot of stuff happening that little kids shouldn't probably see or be part of. But I didn't know any different. That's just the way it was. It, you know, we would go in, and I remember now I know it's harvest time, and all the bud would come back to the city. And that's when we'd come back, like in October and November, and then we'd go back for the rest of the year. And I just thought that was a normal thing, you know. And I, and I remember... There were times when we finally moved to the city, my mom got a, uh, a house, and I remember sometimes I'd wake up and there'd be nobody there, and sometimes I'd wake up and there'd be a lot of people there. Sometimes there'd be people screaming and fighting, and sometimes there'd be people doing stuff that making other people, you know what I mean? It was just the way it was. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't sound right, huh? Um, <laughs> if it sounded bad to you, you should have heard it in my head, you know what I mean? Uh, but it was just chaos, you know what I mean? And what I would do is I would just crawl underneath the coffee table and stay there, or I'd sleep by the stereo because when I heard the sound, it made it easier for me. When it was quiet, it was when I was scared. Um, when I was going into the first grade, you know, I had a grandma that uh, just, just was one of those grandmas that just was consistently in my life. And it was, I was getting ready to go into the, I remember perfectly because it was the night before. And my grandma had called me on the phone, and I was watching Happy Days at the time. I don't know if anybody... Really knows me. Joe probably knows what Happy Days is. He's about that age, you know what I mean. And I was watching Happy Days, and the phone rang, and it was my uh, grandma. She goes, "Hey, how you doing, buddy?" I said, "I'm doing good." She goes, "Are you ready to go to school tomorrow?" I'm like, "Yeah." She's just drilling me with questions, you know. And I, I don't want to really talk to her because I'm watching TV. And she's like, uh, "Do you have your clothes laid out? Do you have your new shoes out? Have you taken a bath? Have you eaten?" And I mean, she's just going on, and I'm getting annoyed. And I said, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." And she goes, I go, "Grandma, I want to go." And she goes, "Okay, can I talk to your mom?" And I said, <clears throat> my mom's at the tavern. The phone number's 282-4440. If you call down there, she's, some guy's going to answer the phone. Ask for Darla, you know, like she wouldn't know who her mom's daughter is. Ask for Darla. It's going to take a few minutes. She'll come to the phone and say I, that she's going to have one more pitcher of beer and she'll be home. And uh, she, my grandma said, give me that number again. And so I gave it to her. You know, and I remember I was watching Laverne and Shirley then, and all of a sudden there was a beating on the door. And I was like, oh, man. And, you know, at this house at the time, I had all the blinds down. I had all the lights on. I had the TV as loud as I could get it. I had a radio going in the kitchen. I just wanted it to look like people were there so nobody would get me. And uh, 
you know, I heard this knocking, and I just got scared, and I crawled underneath the coffee table. And then, I, then the knocking went to the window, and then it went to the back door, and I was just starting to panic. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard my grandma say, Jason, open up the door. It's grandma. And I got that feeling of just ease. You know what I mean? And the fear went away, and I opened it up, and there was my grandma. And she was standing there, and she looked like she'd been crying. She looked like she was mad. And uh, she just said, get your stuff. You're coming to live at my house. And... Uh, that's like hitting the lottery, you know what I mean? You go to Grandma's house, there's Rice Krispie treats, there's popsicles, there's cookies, there's no limit on anything. It's just, it's, I'm in, you know what I mean? I, didn't, I just grabbed my shoes and left. And uh, I remember getting to my house, and my grandparents' house, and running in the front door and going through the front room to the kitchen, and almost when I got to the kitchen, I hear this, hey, what are you doing here? And I look, and my grandpa's sitting there, and I said, well, I live here now. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He didn't, you know, but here's the thing. My grandpa didn't look away. He didn't, uh, he didn't ask my grandma, what the heck, or what are you thinking? He just looked at me and said, yeah, you do, buddy. Come here and give me a hug. And I found out later my grandma didn't ask him. She didn't ask him or she didn't run it by him. She, she just went and got me. And, uh, you know, I slept on that man's lap for the next, probably till I was in the fifth grade every night because I learned what it was to feel safe. You know, my grandpa and I's relationship was kind of different. He was a retired railroad guy, and I was a kid that needed Ritalin probably. And... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't a bad kid, but I mean, I would get in, I mean, I robbed a Kool-Aid stand one time, and, and I tied the kid up to the clothesline pole, and I'm the kind of, I don't ever think out anything, right? So I robbed this Kool-Aid stand with my new bicycle and I, my cap gun, and then I, uh, I tied a kid up to the clothesline pole because I didn't make enough money, and then I got called into dinner, and I just set everything down and went back into the house, and then the police showed up, and uh, luckily back then, that was just a normal thing in our neighborhood, and uh, you know... So I was probably kind of a difficult kid, but not so difficult. But, you know, my grandpa, he would spend a lot of time just staring at me. You know what I mean? He would, like, rub his head like this and look at me, and I'd look at him, and he'd rub his head some more. And, well, let's go for a ride. You know what I mean? Or we're going to go to the store. I mean, he, was, he just didn't know what to do with me, and I was like, I would be going everywhere. And, uh, you know, he bought me this bicycle when I was going into the sixth grade, and this will tell you how our relationship was, is, he buys me this BMX bicycle, and that's when they first came out with BMX bikes. And I thought I had arrived, you know, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I, I took it on the back porch to fix it up, you know. I had to take the, I had to put the handlebars forward, lower the seat, and I started taking off the brakes because it had these handbrakes that were in the way of the, this little thing I wanted to put on the uh, handlebars. So I'm modifying it, and my grandpa comes out, and he says, hey, what are you doing, buddy? I said, well, I'm putting the seat down, putting the handlebars up, and I'm taking off the brakes. And he said, well, how are you going to stop? You know, and I looked at him, and I looked at the bike, and I walked around and did one of these, and I never really thought about that. And I said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put my foot on the back tire, and when it slows down, I'll just jump off. You know, and he looked at me, and he said, well, when you crash, land on your head, because you have nothing up there to hurt. And he walked <laughs> off, right? And I thought to him, man, that guy don't know anything. So needless to say, I... Uh, you know, I lived at a house where everybody parked on the street, and there was a strip of grass and a sidewalk, and there's about 25 concrete stairs up to this little sidewalk, and then another five stairs up a wooden porch to my front door. And I was coming around, and one of my buddies said, hey, I bet you can't ride your bike down the stairs. I was like, oh, yeah, I can. So I took it up on the porch, and by the time I hit the concrete stairs, I couldn't get my feet off the pedals to slow it down, and, and I crashed right into my grandma's car and hit the mirror and split my head wide open. And, and at that moment in time, the only two skills I had were cry and run. So I just started crying. Needless to say, my grandma came out, and she's screaming at me and asking me questions, and she's not waiting for the answers. And uh, <laughs> she's asking me, what do you think? And I was like, man, that's way past anything I anticipated. You know what I mean? I didn't even think of not stopping. That was never in my mind. And, uh, you know, and as we go in there, she's washing me up, and she finally looks at my grandpa. She goes out in the front room, which my grandpa is still sitting in his chair. He ain't even got out. He's still watching the news. It's like a typical Tuesday. And he... Uh, she says, Gerald, you need to take him to the hospital. He needs to get some stitches. And so my grandpa gets up all kind of frustrated and grabs his keys. And as we're walking down the stairs, he looks at me and says, it's a good thing you took them brakes off, huh? <laughs> yeah. And I said, yeah, but I landed on my head. You know what I mean? And, and we kind of laughed. And that's how our relationships were the rest of our life. You know what I mean? I would get in trouble and not go to court, and he would go to court for me. You know what? He was the kind of, he's that kind of guy. He was so honest that if I didn't show up to court, he would tell the judge where I worked, where I lived, and how much money I was making. You know what I mean? So they could figure out how it was going to be paid. And uh, 
he was just that guy. He was there consistently. Um, my grandma, on the other hand, she's the lady that, uh, man, she loved me no matter what. I hope you, if you're in here today or if, you know, uh, if you're an aunt, an uncle, a grandma, a grandpa, or somebody that's raising somebody else's kid, and it's a safe place, thank you. You know what I mean? Thank you. Uh, my grandma loved me no matter what. And, uh, and she always saw the good in certain things. She always saw what, what I wanted, what I didn't want other people to see, you know. And, I, and I, the first time I realized this, I was, it has to do with that bicycle. That might be my problem. It might not be alcohol. My, the year I got that bicycle, I started the middle school. And, uh, and I had been going to class every uh, day for about three weeks, and I had not made it out to recess once. And so uh, finally, one day at the end of the school, there was my grandma standing in the hall, and we had to go into this office to meet with some counselors and some other people to think about putting me in a different class. And I remember we go in there, and there's, they were all sitting on one side of the table, and my grandma and I were sitting on the other side of the table. And they started explaining everything that I had done. You know what I mean? And everything that, the way I was acting, how I didn't have self-control, and I did this, and I did that. And I remember my grandma had that look she had when she came and got me, you know, where she was trying not to cry, but she was, you know, she was just listening. She wasn't arguing with them. She wasn't debating with them. She was just listening. And uh, when they got done, she said, well, you know, can I say something? They said, yeah. She goes, well, I know Jason. I'm not saying he didn't do any of those things because he lives at my house. I get it. But can I tell you some good things about it? She said he's a good kid. Every morning when he goes to school, he runs down to Mrs. Harrington's house and he throws a newspaper up on the front porch so she doesn't have to walk down the stairs. And Shane, the young man at the market that helps out down there, every time I see Shane, first thing he asks is, where's Jason? Because when Jason's around, he always picks him first for every sport and nobody picks on him when he's, at, when he's there. So I know he has a good heart and I know there's a good person inside of there. I believe it's our responsibility as adults to figure out how to tap into that. You know, and I remember thinking... How did she find that stuff out? But most importantly, wow, somebody does have my back and somebody does love me. And, uh, and that's how it was. You know, I remember, I could probably say this, uh, this is my only country story I have. You know, I was, <clears throat> I was in, my grandma took me to church every Sunday, no matter what. If you didn't go to church, you couldn't play. It was like going to school. You had to stay inside. So she would drag us to this Baptist church, and I wasn't really a Baptist, I guess. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't really, even should be in church, to tell you the truth, at that point in time. But I had gone to the rodeo the night before. You know, and they had, like, my grandpa took me, and so the next morning I had to go to church, and needless to say, I got kicked out of church for training to be a cowboy. And so I'm in this office waiting, and at this church, it was like in the old, nowadays they have, like, beepers, and, and they flash a number up on the screen if your kid's bad or something like that. Back then, it was a Baptist church, and they walked down and tapped, the, the deacon did, and, you know, my grandma sat on the left side, the fifth row back, and she was there every Sunday. And every Sunday, they'd have to walk down and tap her, and this is like the fourth or fifth week in a row get her and she comes to get me and this week she was a little upset and then she comes into the office where I was sitting and she goes let's go now and I could tell it was trouble now as we were walking out this guy who ran the church Sunday school department said hey Hazel maybe Jason's to stay home until he learns how to show self-control and my grandma turned around and said hey with his enthusiasm he has for life he might just be the next pastor of this church I'm like whoa I don't want to be a pastor I want to be a rodeo clown <laughs> you know what I mean and uh and my <laughs> My grandma goes, that's cute, get in the car. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. When we got in the car and we were driving home, she goes, you want to be a rodeo clown? I said, yeah. And she said, well, you'd be the best rodeo clown you can be. And that's just how she was. She just had my back no matter what. You know, uh, that same year in the sixth grade, I uh, had my first introduction to alcohol. I uh, went over to a friend's house to stay the night. There was three of us guys going to sleep in the backyard and do what you do in the sixth grade. And uh, his mom came out and said, hey, we're going to go bowling. I ordered you guys a pizza, stay in the yard, the money's on the table, be good. And so they left. Well, when the pizza came, my friend Leif says, hey, pizza tastes better with beer. And I said, yes, it does. And he, so he went downstairs and he brought up this case of Lucky Lager beer. It's nasty. You know what I mean? And we started drinking it. And, uh, you know, at about four or five beers, I got food poisoning. And, uh, <laughs> and I got really sick, man. I'm telling you, it got bad. And, uh, I said, man, I got to go home. I think something's wrong with the pizza. And so I, I, I rode my bike home drunk and uh, with no brakes. That should be something for you. And I remember going home, and I got home, and I went to my room. And, and usually when you're sick at my grandma's house, like she would put a, a towel on the pillow. She'd put a bucket by the bed. She'd put a nightlight. They'd put cool water. They'd have a little fan. I mean, she, it was kind of good being sick at my house. You know what I mean? But nobody came in all night. There was nothing. And that, that was the first time I had been sick where... 
I didn't get it. You know what I mean? I was just sick. And so the next morning I wake up and uh, my grandpa's at the end of my bed telling me, get up, I got to go to work. And I'm like, man, I don't have a job. I'm in the sixth grade. He said, if you're going to drink like a big boy, you're going to work like a big boy. Now get out of bed. So obviously this is a serious moment for him. And so I, uh, I get up and as we're walking out, my grandma hands me a warm egg salad sandwich and some warm milk and tells me have a great day. Yeah. And uh, we went by and picked up Sean and Leif and we went and picked strawberries. Yeah, I made 27 cents, and it's been like 40 years I remember that. Um, all I remember is getting sick, and I couldn't eat strawberries for a long time. I couldn't even smell strawberries, you know what I mean? I would, I would get sick. I'd look at my grandpa over on the back of his tailgate, drinking his coffee, reading the paper, laughing. And then, you know, finally I just told my friends, hey, I'm never drinking again. And they said, what? You're never going to drink again? I said, yeah, I'm done. And uh, they said, you didn't like how, what it felt like? I said, no, I just don't want to work no more. You know what I mean? I'm done. So I quit cold turkey. No AA, no steps, no treatment, no recovery. <laughs> Done. You know what I mean? And, it, and, I, and I did really well up to about freshman in high school. That was, it was two or three years, a good run. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, when you come to high school, for me, I was good at sports. And uh, we partied a lot on the weekends. And what I found out is that if we saved our lunch money on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we could show the tap on Thursday, and we'd have booze for Friday and Saturday. And that's how my life became. Is it just, it, I realized later that that's when my alcoholism kicked in because everything focused around what was going to happen on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. You know? and, uh, and that's how it was. You know? And I, I would get a minor in possession here and a minor in possession there, and my grandma would take me to church, and they'd pray for me, and then I'd go do it again. My problem was is I, just, I, I got a keg somehow and a tap, and so I refused to run. You know what I mean? I, I would just hang out with the tap, and the cops would come and take me home, and I'd get another ticket. And they told me I couldn't drive till I was 21, and I was all right with that because then I could drink more. Um, but that's how it was. I just, there was nobody going to jail. There was, I mean, if you got in trouble, they just took you home. And, uh, and that's how it was. And then May, May 5th, 1989, I got my first alcohol where it really did something to me. I, uh, and this is kind of hearsay. It's like a police report. Um, I had borrowed a motorcycle. The police report says I stole a motorcycle. <laughs> and I got in a high-speed chase, and uh, I crashed. That was before cops, where you could see the ending. You know what I mean? Uh, so I crashed, and I woke up in a, uh, in a helicopter going on life flight, and I ended up in a hospital in an intensive care unit. And uh, the lady told me I had a one out of six chance of uh, saving my leg and a three out of five chance of living. And, and I didn't know what that meant. She said, "Your leg, they're going to take your left leg off but you'll probably live. And then I said, well, what happened? She said, you were in a drunk driving accident. And I, and I didn't remember anything. And then the next day when I came to, there was an officer at the end of my bed explaining to me what happened to my charges. And I remember asking him, how do you know it was me? And he said, well, they saw you steal the motorcycle and you were at the crash site, so we just assume it's you. <laughs> and uh, all right, you know what I mean? And so I, uh, I got 3,000 hours of community service. I had six charges. They gave me 500 hours of each charge. I worked in a... Franklin High School in the book room all year long to, to do my time. But, you know, what happened then is when I was in that hospital, I told myself I, that I would never drink or use again. I just wouldn't do it. And, uh, you know, and I got out in that, in that, some people talk about that anxiety inside your stomach or that fear or that doubt or that, man, I might be a piece of crap, started kicking in. And, and the only thing that would take those demons away was to drink, you know, and I would just drink. And I played that card as much as I could. I played it. I played it so I could stay on people's couches, and they would, like, you know, go to one friend, and I'd stay there for a month. I'd go to another friend, and I'd stay there for a month. And then eventually I was selling people's stuff when they weren't home and, and doing things I shouldn't have been doing. I was getting asked not to go where. And at the end, I was, I was living in a house that it was everybody's house until the police came, and then nobody knew whose house it was. Um, <laughs> we never had power. We liked candlelight. We had a hose that went to the neighbor's house so you could go get water to put it in the toilet to flush the toilet. But it wasn't that bad. It was kind of like camping in town. And... Uh, and that's how it was, you know what I mean? And, and it just, I just kept lowering my standards to keep up with my quality of life is all I did, you know what I mean? And I, and, and I just didn't find anything wrong with that. But the problem was every few months or so, my uncles would come and find me and tell me, hey, you need to call your grandma. You need to call grandma. She's bothering all of us. She calls me day and night. She calls me when she wakes up. All you need to do is call her and tell her you're okay. Would you do that? And so they would take me to a payphone. I'd call my grandma and I'd tell her, man, I'm doing all right. I'll come see you tomorrow. You know, and I wouldn't go. I didn't go because I didn't want to go. I don't go because I just start drinking and I forget to go. You know what I mean? I had a lot of good plans. It, I mean, alcohol did a lot for me. Alcohol saved my life sometimes because there was times I wanted to kill myself, and then I would start drinking, and I'd just say, hell, it's, I'm having a good time now. 
And I, I just hang in there, you know what I mean? Over, almost overreacted. And, uh, <laughs> you know, gee, George, that was close. And, uh, and that's what I did, you know. And then on uh, December 4th, 1997, one of my uncles came to my, uh, my house, whoever's house it was, and he found me and he said, hey, you need to come with me up to the hospital. Your grandma's been on life support, and they took her off, and you need to go see her. And, uh, and I said, I don't know if I want to go. And he said, I didn't ask you if you wanted to go. You're going to get in the truck, and you're going to go. And when we got in the trunk, my uncle Leroy gave me a bottle, a pint of booze, and I started drinking it. You know, and we got to that hospital, and you have to go up these stairs and go out of an elevator. And, you know, when you come there and somebody's in ICU in Oregon, they have a whole bunch of people, all your family's out in this, like, big waiting room, and then, like, two or three people can go in at a time. And I remember when I walked in, I didn't look at anybody because I already felt like a piece of crap. I didn't need anybody to tell me I was a piece of crap. I already knew that I didn't match up to anybody in my family, and I already knew that I was the problem. You know, and, and so I, I sat down, and I see my grandpa come out, and he just looked at me. And that was the only time I ever seen my grandpa cry, and he went a different direction, didn't even say anything to me. And uh, I remember just sitting there trying to not – I just wanted to die. You know what I mean? And I remember when my one aunt comes out, Aunt Sandy, she said, your grandma's been off of life support. She hasn't came to, you know, you need to go in there and say what you got to say, and then you need to get. And I said, all right. And so I went in there, and uh, my Uncle Gary and my other Uncle John were in there. And I grabbed my aunt, grandma's hand. I said, Grandma, I'm here. And she sat right up. You know what I mean? And uh, so everybody came to the door, and, and we started talking. And, uh, you know, I did, all I could say is I love you. You know, I love you, and, and I'll come back tomorrow and see you. And uh, I remember as I was leaving, she told my one Uncle Gary, she said, he's a good kid. There's a good kid inside of there. He's a good kid. And uh, so you guys just need to look after him. And, and I left. And I, uh, I just walked back to my shed or whatever you want to call it, house, and, uh, and drank because I didn't know how to deal with that. You know what I mean? And a couple of days later, my uncle finds me again, one of my other uncles, Dale's, and he said, uh, your grandma passed, and the memorial's on this day, and I'll come pick you up. And that was on a Wednesday. And I remember that Wednesday morning, I, uh, I'd been up for a couple of days doing what you have to do to you know, when, when something bad like that happens, a lot of people like to give you stuff. So it's a good way to get dope back then and, and more alcohol because they feel sorry for you. And I was just going for it. And when it came time to go, I couldn't go. I hid in the closet. And my mom came and my other uncles came and they were beating on the windows trying to get in. And I didn't, I didn't go because I didn't know how to face that. All I knew how to do was drink. You know, and I just drank and I drank and I drank. And, uh, you know, I didn't make it to the funeral. You know, and I remember my one Uncle Dale standing out. I could hear him out there saying, Jason, you need to come now. If you don't come now, you're going to regret this the rest of your life. And I didn't care. I was already a piece of crap. It wasn't going to amount to anything. And so I, I just didn't go. You know, but you know how it is when uh, alcohol quits working and drugs quit working. You, just, you know, you're just screwed up and nothing's, nothing's killing that feeling. And that was like that for like three weeks. And so finally I just, I don't know what happened. I just called my Uncle Gary and I said, hey, uh, are you going to church today? And he said, yeah. And I said, can I meet you there? And he said, yeah. The only reason I wanted to meet him at church because I knew he wouldn't beat me up in front of all those old people. <laughs> I knew I had a butt kicking coming, but you know what I mean? Because he's like eight years older than me, and we lived in the same house, and we're closer to age than my mom and him are, and my aunt and him are. And so I get to church, and, uh, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't showered in a while, at least a couple of weeks. I hadn't had really anything in my body that was helping me quit from shaking. You know, I was, I was feeling sick from the inside out, and I, and I was just heart sick, you know, and... Uh, I remember we're sitting in this row where my grandma sits, and they started singing How Great Thou Art, and then they started singing Amazing Grace, and, man, I got caught up in the moment, and I just, I looked at my uncle, I said, man, I think I have a drinking problem, and the whole church went quiet, you know what I mean? <laughs> my uncle says it was the end of the song. <laughs> You're not that powerful, is what he told me later. He's in recovery. He has 18 years. Uh, he, I said, I think I might have a drug problem if it makes you feel better about yourself. And he says, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to my house after church. You're going to take a shower because you stink, and we're going to talk about it. And I thought, man, what I heard was we're going to go to your house. You're going to feed me. You're going to give me $20, and I'm going to go on my way. So I went to his house. I got in the shower. I came out, and there's a phone book on the, on the counter. And he says, you're going to go to treatment. I said, what's treatment? He said, this is no time for your discussions or anything. You're going to call a treatment center. So I looked up in the hospitals, and the, the first one was this place called Portland Adventist, and I didn't think anybody would be open on a Sunday. And they were. And uh, so I said, uh, hey, uh, my name is Jason Johnson, and I need to talk to somebody about treatment. So they passed me over to somebody else, and I told this lady, I said, hey, uh, my uncle thinks I have a drinking problem, and I need to go to treatment. And she said, well, she asked me some questions. She said, can you be at our 
our uh, clinic tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I said, well, yeah, I can be there. So I got off the phone and I told my uncle, hey, I got an appointment. How about you give me 20 bucks and I'll see you there or I'll go there tomorrow. And he says, I'll just take you. You can stay here tonight. That sucked. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was nowhere in my plans. I have a lot going on in life. And uh, he says it's a leather couch. I think it's plastic. I slept on his couch. He had a little dog. It licked me all night. I was sweating. I was like, yeah, you know when you're detoxing and it's, and I had done a bunch of pain pills, so I was peeing in the wrong spots, and it was just bad. And this dog's licking at me, and I'm turning on this couch, and the dog won't leave me alone. And morning comes, and he asks me, how did you sleep? I said, fine. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I went in and took another shower, and when he went to take a shower, for some reason, I just remembered he had a liquor cabinet, and I already felt better. You know what I mean? I went to the liquor cabinet. I found some Bacardi 151, poured it in this Coke can, started chugging it, and I'm ready to go to treatment. You know what I mean? And... Uh, we get in his truck, and we're driving there, and he goes, man, I smell alcohol. I said, well, it's not me. I'm going to treatment. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what treatment is, but I know I can't take alcohol. You know what I mean? And I'm no dummy. And so I, uh, I just took that can, and I hit it by the door in the seat. And uh, when we got to the treatment facility, the hospital, I went into the bathroom, pulled up the uh, bag, and I put that can underneath there because I didn't want to get caught. And uh, that gave my, time, my uncle time to meet this guy, Tim P., who was the I don't know, the intake guy or whatever. And so we went into this office, and uh, my uncle went with us. He wasn't letting me get away with anything. And so we're sitting there, and they asked me if I had insurance. And I said, I don't even have a job. And my uncle said, his grandpa and I will pay for his treatment. And I thought, wow, I wonder how much that cost. He should have just gave me the money. I would have bought a house, a couple ounces, and re-upped, and I'd been better off. You know what I mean? Is what I was thinking. And so I was like, okay. And they said, well, we're going to ask you some questions. You need to be honest about some stuff. And so they started asking me questions. And one of the questions was, have you ever lied about your alcohol use or your drug use to your family or friends? And I looked at my uncle. I thought, dang, I did that on the way over here. No. You know what I mean? Have you ever hid your alcohol use from your friends or family or employer? And I was like, no, I haven't done that either. But I said no to like about 25 of these questions or 24 of them. So I knew I had to say yes to something. So they said, have you ever drank before an important meeting or engagement? And I looked at these and I, guys, and I thought, man, this is pretty important to these two guys. And I said, yes. And, man, I had a wristband and I was in treatment just like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got a shot in the behind. I got put in this room. I'm asleep. And this guy, Tim, keeps coming in and saying, hey, you got to go to group. And finally I had to tell him, hey, I'm not in group. I'm in treatment. Leave me alone. <laughs> I found out I was in treatment in his group. And... Uh, and then it got worse because I found out I was in an uh, Adventist, and they don't have caffeine, sugar, or women. And when you're 28 years old, those are all important things in your life at that moment in time, especially when you have nothing to give. And so I, uh, I was just, it was miserable. You know what I mean? There's like six of us. It was December 29th. Nobody's coming to treatment two days before the new year. And it's these guys that are, they need to be in treatment, these guys I'm with, you know. And they start talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, right, and how they're going to go to a meet and this van's going to come pick them up and take them from our prison, which I found out later you can leave whenever you want. I didn't know that. You know, they should have they put that on a flyer or something. You can leave on your own will. No, none of that. I thought I was locked up. And uh, they talked about this van going to AA. I said, well, what's AA? They said, well, there's caffeine, sugar, and a lot of women. So I said, well, what do I got to do? They said, you got to go talk to Tim to see if you can go. So I wrote down this, all the stuff I was going to do. I was going to be the group on time. I was going to do the step work he asked me to do. I'd pray with him. I would sit and I'd answer all the questions. I mean, I gave him everything. I said, can I go to A? And he said, sure, just sign that piece of paper over there. And I was like, that's it? He's like, yeah. I was like, ah, overcommitted again. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm really not going to do any of those things. And so we get in this van and this anxiety and fear come over me again. You know, and I start praying, man, I hope I don't know anybody there and I hope I owe nobody money. And, uh, you know, I told you my mom and dad got divorced when I was, like, two or three. And I'd seen my dad one time before this, like, when I was 26. So I hadn't seen him for probably 20, 22 years. And uh, he came back to pay back all the back child support to my mom. And I went to the bank to get my half of the money. Another thing that sponsorship made me pay back um, wasn't my money. It was my mom's money. And uh, so I, I saw him, and I left, and that was it. And uh, I said hi to him. And as we get to this... AA meeting, we walk in, and, you know, I'm eating all their candy, drinking all their coffee, looking at any girl that would look at me. And uh, all of a sudden, I look back, and I say, hey, man, that looks like my dad. And they're like, your dad? You don't know your own dad? I said, well, I've seen him one time in, like, 23 years. You sh that's him? I said, I think so. 
And they said, well, you got to go talk to him. I said, okay, don't rush into anything. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm eating candy right now and drinking coffee. I don't want to get kicked out. You know what I mean? Well, they have a break. I don't go to meetings with breaks anymore. They had this break in the meeting. So I walk up to this guy and I said, hey, and with my little clan behind me, I said, hey, do you know who I am? And he said, nope. I said, I think you're my dad. And he said, Jason? And I said, yeah. And I met my dad at my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and it was kind of like a burning bush. You know what I mean? I was like, wow. And it got even better because he goes, hey, can I come visit you? I was like, yeah. The only person coming to my treatment is my mom and my crazy uncle who needs treatment. You know what I mean? And uh, needless to say, I forgot to tell my mom that my dad was coming, and that was an interesting two weeks of treatment. <laughs> Took a lot of heat off me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Explained a lot of my dynamics. You know what I mean? That's my gene pool right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> now you know why I sit here. <laughs> uh, but you know what? He was involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was doing a ninth step. You know what I mean? And he was, he was a GSR. He was really involved. And he just started dragging me to meetings and dragging me everywhere. And that was when I was on that dry drunk. And that dry drunk, I, I, I met a girl that was a secretary at a meeting. And I married her because I thought it was the right thing to do. And then we got pregnant just like that. And uh, we had a kid. And I mean, life was going good. And then, I, uh, and then I got into the funk and I met John. And when I met John, I got John as my sponsor at AA went in a different direction. I started feeling part of. And, and at about seven, eight years of sobriety, I, I was sitting in church one day and I thought, man, maybe I'm not an alcoholic. Maybe if it wasn't because they were singing that stupid Amazing Grace song that makes you cry every time and how great thou art, I wouldn't be an AA. You know what I mean? That was my thinking. So I started taking unprincipled actions in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was going to meetings, but I was doing other things. On Mar May 1st, or March 1st, 2007, I had uh, purchased a car because I was doing pretty good at my unprincipled actions. And uh, I took it to this place called Les Schwab. I don't think they have them down here. It's a tire center. And they put wheels and tires on it, and I'm pulling out, and the wheel falls off, right? And I'm like, oh, man. You know, I'm all mad. And they're like, hey, it was our fault. We'll rent you a new car. And they rented me this Chrysler, uh, Chrysler 300. You know, it looks like a Rolls Royce kind of thing. And I was like, man, I grew up in felony flats. I was like, man, I have arrived. You know what I mean? And and so I'm in this car, and I go to my buddy's house. I count my money, and I go meet my friend who I've been meeting every day for, like, the last year. And I had purchased 157 grams of meth. And uh, I'm driving in the car, and, and, I, and I'm sober, and I have no drugs or alcohol in my body. And I turn the corner, and my car gets swarmed. And, uh, and there's, there's cops everywhere, you know. And I didn't know what to do with this stuff, so I just stuck it under the front seat because that's what good drug dealers do, you know what I mean? It was, it's a rental car. You know, I have proof of insurance, a valid driver's license. It was the guy who brought it to me. You know, that's, that was my plan. Well, there were more cops came, and more cops came. The news came. And uh, so I'm sitting in this car trying to act like none of it's going on, you know, when you're, you're just talking on your phone, but nobody's there. And uh, this officer walks up to the car, and I roll down the window like I didn't know he was coming. And uh, he said, Jason, can you shut the car off and step up on the curb? That's another bad sign when they know your name before you even give them any ID. You know what I mean? So I shut the car off, and I open up the door to get out, and I hear this, and I look down, and the seat's moving back all by itself. And yeah, not funny at all right there. And uh, it went all the way back. And needless to say, my, my dope was right in the middle of the floor. And uh, you can't yell time out. You can't yell do over. And I don't know about Texas, but you can't reach under the seat. You know what I mean? When everybody else has a gun. So uh, I just shut the door and hoped nobody would see it. And uh, they saw it. And I got charged with commercial possession, commercial delivery, racketeering, intimidation of a federal witness, and a gun charge. All that sober. You know what I mean? With not anything in my body. With my best thinking. With nobody else's advice. That's what I had. And I remember thinking, boy, how am I going to get out of this? And uh, it got worse. You know, I, went to, I got booked in this booking cell with a bunch of people. Kind of looked like this section over here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And... Uh, not that Joe's over here. I don't want to get offended. My guy, and Alan, I got to get a ride home. Alan's the one that's been driving me around. So I'm going to go with this section over here. Um, I'm sitting in there, and then all of a sudden there's this, na 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 meth watch, 2007, you know, on the news. And there's my driver's license picture and all the drugs. And I'm thinking, oh, man, my family saw that. My wife saw that. My sponsor saw oh, I'm screwed. You know what I mean? And I was. And uh, what happened was is when I got out, I put a needle in my arm, and I started drinking again. And I, and I destroyed everything, you know what I mean? Because that, that guilt, that shame, and embarrassment that I felt when I walked into that hospital that day was back just like that, you know? And, and my wife divorced me, which was a great call on her behalf, 
You know what I mean? I was stealing everything. I mean, the lowest part of my, when I was out there running at the last, the lowest part I remember, one of the parts that was worse is my daughter, when my daughter was born, we started saving the uh, quarters with the states on the back, and there was like three or four buckets of them. And Julie let me come over and visit Bailey if I looked like I'd been all right, not high and sorting bolts in the garage. Um, <laughs> so I went to take a shower, and when I'm coming out of the shower, she's coming down the hall. My daughter's like six at the time, and she's coming down the hall, and she has the bucket. She's going, you stole your daughter's money. Who steals their daughter's money? And I remember thinking to myself, I stole the money. I know that. But what got me is my daughter's pulling on my wife's pants saying, please don't make my daddy leave. I let him borrow it. And when she said that, I just wanted to die. You know what I mean? I just, I just left. And I, and I went and I drank and I ran and I ran and I ran and I ran. And all I know how to do at that moment in time is drink. Drink and put a needle in my arm. That's, that's my best thing I have for life. And, you know, and a few months later, I went in front of a judge again, and she finally just sentenced me to 48 months in prison. And uh, I thought she said four to eight months. <laughs> Found out later it was four years. And, uh, yeah, and then if you ever get arrested in the state of Oregon, I'm just going to save you some time. They've been running the jail systems, the sheriff's offices, since the 1800s. They really don't need your opinion. You know what I mean? I'll say, it got me three weeks in the hole because I gave them my opinion. And, uh, you know, finally when I got out of the hole and I was put into population, but I need to tell you this, when I was in the hole and there was nobody coming to get me or nobody could see me for 22 hours a day, I think is what it was, I still had that fear, anxiety, and failure. And I started doing what I remember John told me to do. I'd get on my knees and I'd say, please help, thank you, amen. And then I, if I got like four or five minutes of any kind of serenity, serenity, I'd get on my knees and I'd say thanks. And that's how I got through the, being locked up like that. I got put into population. And when, before I went into, when I was on my run the last half, there was a gentleman named Randy. He's a really good friend of ours. He's in the program. He, uh, at the time, he had a daughter in college, two daughters in high school, and a boy with special needs. And, uh, I had borrowed 3000 I stole $3,000 from him. You know what I mean? I, and I was going to go double it up in a video poker machine and pay my attorney, and, and I lost it all. And I just went call him, and he would try to call me, and I went call him. And, you know, I, I get put into population. They take me to visitation, and I don't know about here, but visitation there, you go into a room. It has a plexiglass, a phone on each side, and you're locked in this room for 30 minutes. And if the visitation goes bad, you just have to stare at that person for 30 minutes. If it goes good, you just stare at that person for 30 minutes. If it's just a 30-minute deal. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm walking in there, and you know who's on the other side of the glass? It's Randy. And I just, it's like, when you know, oh, man, it's never good when you run into somebody you owe money. And uh, I just got that fear, and I, I just started sweating, and, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. And they're trying to put me in there, and I'm trying to fight getting in, locked in that room, and I'm trying to get out. And they're like, you got to go. And in there, and it's your visitation. And he's just sitting there looking at me, and, I just, and all I could think was, man, you better invite God to go with you. And so I sat down, and I sat down to him, and I said, hey, Randy, man, I'm sorry for stealing that money. As soon as I get out of here, I'll pay you back. And he said to me, he said, Jason, I'm not here for the money. I'm here to tell you I love you, and, we're, and you're a good friend of mine. And my wife and my kids have given me their Christmas money, and they want to know what your daughter and wife would like from you for Christmas this year. And, and, and I didn't know what to say. I just cried. You know what I mean? But if I, I, I left there thinking, if that guy can forgive me on that, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know Ah, oh, man, I've tried to pay him back his $3,000, and he won't take it. I've had him landscape his yard, his daughter's yard, his other's daughter's yard. I had to help pay for part of a wedding. So I think he's got his money back, you know what I mean? But the thing is, is I, uh, I don't know if I'm that guy. And, uh, but what it did is it gave me hope. It gave me a release into myself. And when I got out of there, I got released at three months and 27 days of a four-year sentence. Uh, three judges in Alcoholics Anonymous signed a piece of paper for me to serve my time in the community. And all I had to do was stay sober and get a job. And what I did is I got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. I went back and I told John, I need help. We started from ground one and we started doing the deal again. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous has uh, taught me a lot of things. It's just not about drinking and using. It's taught me how to be a, a parent. It's taught me how to be a father. You know, my, my daughter, when I first got locked up, she was like six or seven. She's kind of like, she was like me. She's just running around 100 miles an hour and, and one day she had a friend over Cody that was spending the night, and they're running and running. And I yelled at them so bad that they went and hid in my daughter's closet and called Cody's mom to come get them because they were scared of me. And my wife had to get on the phone and talk to them and tell her it's not like that. You know, and so I went to my sponsorship line, and I said, we have a meeting once a month with a bunch of guys in our sponsorship line. You can discuss anything you want about Alcoholics Anonymous that you can't discuss in the meetings. Right? So I said, I don't know how to be a father. I want to kill my kid or my wife at any time. What do I do? 
And this guy, Larry, one of the not agains I can't stand, he says, well, this is what you do. He says, my kids love you. Every time we go to an A event, the first thing they ask, is Jason going to be there? Because when they see you, you hug them, you tell them you love them, you make sure they're entertained and they're fed. Why don't you start treating your daughter like you're babysitting my kids? I said, that's stupid. So I started doing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> what happened is a few years later, my daughter was 13, and she had a slumber party at our house, and there was like eight little girls in this bedroom, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and my wife's shaking me. She says, you need to get up and go tell them to uh, be quiet. I said, I didn't invite them. It's none of my business. <laughs> so she hit me and told me to go get them. And so me and my little French bulldog, we went in there to give them hell. And we did. You know, I screamed at him, yelled at him, told him to turn the lights off, right, right, right. And I slammed that door, and we went back to bed. And I'm laying there, and I'm thinking, man, is, I might be the only example of Alcoholics Anonymous. I might be the only example of a good father to those kids. You don't treat anybody that way. And so I fought that fight, and finally I get up, and I go back in the room, and I open the door and turn on the light, and they're all just sitting there staring at me. And, and they look kind of scared. I said, man, I'm sorry for yelling at you girls. I said, uh, here's what we need to do. We just need to turn the lights down, turn the TV down, and act like you're going to sleep because you're making Julie really mad. <laughs> And uh, the miracle of that is when I went to leave, that girl, Cody, who's my daughter's best friend, said, I told you guys he would come back and apologize. You know, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me. It's taught me how to be a better person. The, my wife that divorced me, and she took me back. It was her own mistake. You know what I mean? <laughs> a lot of people ask her why in our home. It's like, question, it's not about AA, but why would you marry him twice? You know what I mean? <laughs> that's not right. Um, you know, my wife and I, we... Uh, we got, she got pregnant again. She was about six months pregnant, and, uh, you know, something happened, and she, uh, she just called me one day and said, they can't find a heartbeat. We need to go to this, this certain situation. And I said, oh, well, uh, what's that mean? She goes, just meet me out there. I have to do this ultrasound thing. So I called my sponsor, and I said, uh, John, I said, this is what's going on. I don't know what to do. What should I say? He says, Jason, you're not the only scared person in this relationship. He said, you need to go there and just hold Julie's hand and tell her you love her and don't talk. And so I went there and I did that, you know, and we found out we had lost the baby and uh, she was going to have to have this procedure. But a couple nights before this, I was at a, I went to this meeting and I don't know about here in Texas, but every group has like a Roy who's kind of, he's a greeter, but he shouldn't be the greeter, right? So I walk up to Roy one day and I said, hey, Roy, how you doing? He's like, screw you, screw God, screw Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll sit by you at the meeting. You know what I mean? And so I sat at the meeting with him that night. He was on this side of me. It was me. My sponsor, and then Mike, the guy who never does anything wrong, not again, and then a couple other people. I mean, Mike, the, he's like the poster child for sponsorship. And uh, so we're sitting there, and it gets to Roy's part, and it's a big book study, and it gets to Roy's part to read, and it's the third step prayer, right? And so he's just sitting there like this, and I'm like, Phew. and so a couple of minutes, and people are starting to stare at us, you know, and people say, hey, we're at this page, and you're like, I know where we're at. We don't need you to tell us, you know what I mean? And so I read it. And then my sponsor read his paragraph, and then as Mike was reading, my sponsor leaned over and goes, hey, that was between Roy and God. Don't ever get in the way of it. So I looked at Roy. I said, thanks a lot, Roy. You have a problem with God, and I have a problem with John now. Thanks. <laughs> you know, same thing, really. You know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, we found out we lost that baby, and, and, and we had to be there the next morning to have this procedure she had to do or whatever. And so uh, it's like 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. It had snowed that night, and all of a sudden we're sitting down in this, like, big glass area, and we see this guy going like this. Right? And I'm like, Jesus, there's Roy. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to duck. And all of a sudden, he starts jumping up and down and waving. I'm like, oh, God, he saw us. You know what I mean? And it's just going bad for me. And he comes in, and he comes up. And I, my wife's like, hey, Roy, what are you doing here? She goes, this is a big deal. I'm here to support you guys. And I found out he had taken the day off work without pay. He left his house at 3 o'clock in the morning, drove in the snow. He'd been walking around the hospital looking in all the windows trying to find us. You know what I mean? And uh, my wife thinks Roy walks on water. I think Roy's still that guy at the meeting. You know what I mean? Uh, but here's what happened is when they took my wife back to do the surgery, we were in this waiting room. There was probably 30, 40 people. And uh, Roy looked at me and he said, hey, we need to get on our knees and pray. I said, I thought you had a problem with God. He said, this is no time for my problems with God. <laughs> we need to pray. I said, screw you, Roy. Screw God. Screw Alcoholics Anonymous. And he got on his knees and started praying. And at first I was embarrassed. You know how when somebody does something, you just like start sweating. You're looking you're like, Jesus, people are staring at us. They're looking at you. He was on his knees the whole time she was back there. And when she got done, they called us back. He got up, and people hugged him. You know, and that's the finest example of Alcoholics Anonymous I've ever seen. You know what I mean? There's a guy who wasn't intimidated by he had He has a belief in something that he believed in, and that's what he was going to do. He didn't care what anybody else thought. And when he did that, people looked at him differently. You know what I mean? I thought, man. So now 
I can go to a Starbucks and do the third step prayer on my knees. You know what I mean? The Starbucks buyer house, like, oh, God, here comes Jason, the Jesus freak guy. He, he doesn't know we're just trying to stay sober. He just thinks we're church-going people. That's because of him. Um, you know, I've had many things that happen. My daughter, she's 19 years old now, and, uh, you know, the, I guess our relationship's really good. You know, I, uh, I'll tell you one quick story, and then I'll get done with that. My, uh, my, my, so my wife and daughter went on vacation to Canada because I can't go there. You know what I mean? They have guys like me. Well, the letter says they have guys like me there. They don't want to import them. Um, so I can't get into Canada. And so uh, they went up there for a vacation. And the whole way they're going, they're just texting me, blowing me up. You know, they're, oh, we're doing this, sending pictures. And about two days before they were coming back, I started getting nothing. You know, there was, I thought, well, maybe they wrecked the car. Maybe they stole my credit card. I'm looking at the bank, trying to figure out what's going on. Nothing. No communication. Like, I text. I go, okay. They were, on our way, you know, nothing like, it was usually like a book. And uh, so I started playing Perry Mason, and I started trying to figure out what was going on and what happened, and, and I had a whole bunch of stuff made up in my mind, kind of like, I guess, what Alan Ons do. I don't want to say that because that guy might beat me up, but <laughs> he's bigger than I am. He might just kill me. But I, was, I, was, I guess I was in Alan on for a while. And uh, when they got home, my daughter goes straight to her room, up the stairs to her room, and my wife comes in, and the dog and I are sitting there looking at her, and she goes, hey, I need to talk to you about something. I said, I bet you do. And so I went out and looked at the car, and there's nothing wrong with it, and I looked in their bags. There's no extra stuff. She goes, I need to talk to you about some stuff, but you can't say anything. You can't blow up. I said, all right, I won't blow up. My daughter's 17, so I mean, I know how to be a good father by now. And she said, all right, I'm going to tell you, but you can't overreact. I said, I won't. She said, well, Bailey got a tattoo. Holy mackerel. I saw a Tramp stamp. I saw Aerosmith concerts. I saw stripper poles. And don't get me wrong. I love strippers. One of my best crime partners was a stripper. But the thing is, I just lost it. You know what I mean? I have a whole sleeve. I've been on a men's retreat. So I, you know what I mean? I, 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 I have the tattoos. In a, but I just, I lost it. I screamed at her, told her she's going to go to jail or prison. And uh, I went upstairs and I yelled at my daughter and I Asked what the hell she's doing with her life. Why could you do that? You know, I didn't even see the test. I just gave it to her. Came back downstairs to yell at my wife. My wife says, you probably should go for a, a ride. I told her I was going to go for a drive. She says, she told me, I, I think it's my idea. I get in the car, and I'm driving. And so I do what I think I should do. I call an Allen on, you know, because I'm going to find out how you deal with this. And so I called this lady in uh, Oklahoma. It's a friend of my wife's. And I, and I told her everything, and, and I told her how they got the tattoo, and they did it, and she's 17, and she's a minor, and they didn't ask my permission, and who do I call for an attorney, and who's going to jail, and, <laughs> and I'm not getting any response back. There's not even an uh-huh. There's not even an agreement. There's nothing. And I, uh, so I get done, and she goes, are you done? I said, yeah. What do you think we should do? She goes, well, I, it's not a we thing. I know what you need to do. I go, what's that? She goes, well, you want to know what just happened here? I said, yeah, my, my daughter got a tattoo. My wife took her. Somebody's going to jail. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's clean and simple. You know what I mean? She goes, no, what you just did is you told your daughter she wasn't beautiful. You told her that any decision she makes is not going to be amount to what you believe in. And you told her that she has no value. And I said, that's not what I meant. You know what I mean? Jesus, I didn't mean it like that. So I'm kind of trying not to cry. And she said, what do I do? She goes, you got to go back and make that right. So as I'm driving back, I hear Cliff say, well, you better invite God to go with you. And, you know, I can hear him yelling on the thing because it's in my speaker on my car. And I'm like, whatever. You know what I mean? I know that. And so I get back in there and I go into the house and I tell my wife, I think I overreacted. She says, yes, you did. I know I overreacted because the dog usually loves me and he's just sitting on his bed like you're on your own on this one. And <laughs> you know what I mean? So I go upstairs and my daughter's in the room crying, you know, and I got to sit down beside her and tell her, man, I made a mistake. You're the most beautiful girl I know. You're the smartest person I know, and I love you with all my heart, and I don't care what you do. You know, and we hugged, and, you know, she goes, I knew you'd come back, Dad. And uh, she goes, you want to see the tattoo? And I was like, okay, you know what I mean? And uh, so she pulls up her shirt on the side, and it has an AA symbol, and it says one day at a time, and it has these two hands like this. And I'm like, ah, she goes, you want to know what it means? And I'm like, First thing I thought was, man, you're not an alcoholic, and we're not Catholic. But I didn't say those things. I've learned in the few, last few minutes about just to keep my mouth shut. And uh, she goes, if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, you and Mom would have never met. And I wouldn't be here. And, and the hand going like this is Mom's hand because she's always putting her hand out and doing the coffee and serving the cookies and stuff. And she goes, the hand like this, that's your hand, Dad, because you're always helping people up. You know, we both sat there and cried, you know. And I thought it couldn't get any worse. And I was at this thing with this lady named Polly Pistol, this little old lady. 
And when my wife tells the story, it isn't as funny. And, uh, <laughs> and Polly's like, Jason, Jason, sweetie. And I was like, what, Polly? She goes, what's it feel like when God kicks you right in the nuts? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, it's brutal people, you know what I mean? And, uh, but today I have, a re I have a phenomenal relationship with my wife and my daughter. You know, uh, I'll end with this. You know, the, the thing with my grandma, that amends, you know what I mean? It, it, the serenity thing, it says up here on the thing, you know, I found peace and serenity. And I, did, I could never get right without going to that funeral. You know what I mean? I have to drive by the cemetery she's at for three times a day, three times a week. And I, uh, man, I just, sometimes I'd pull over and I'd almost get sick because I was, how did I do that? How could, I, how could I be that guy? You know, and I know, I understand I'm an alcoholic and addict, but man, it just, I just, I would go, I've gone to priests, I've gone to everybody, I've had, I've had my grand sponsors, I've had everybody, I've, I've wrote letters, I've, I went to the grave every week at a certain time, I've looked for butterflies flying by, I looked for a bird flying by, I looked for the grass being mowed, uh, I've done a lot of things and I could just never get that healing, that never, that guilt and that shame and that embarrassment out of there, and, uh, one day I'm on a plane and I get this email and I was reading it and it's a story about this little boy. And this little boy had a, he was the oldest in his family and when his sisters were born, his parents kind of started paying attention to them, him, the girls. And so he knew his dad loved football. So he went and asked his dad if he could sign up for football. And his mom and dad said, yeah, you can. So they went and signed him up and he realized right away he's not an athlete. But the thing he found out is after every game, his dad would come find him and hug him and tell me he loved him and how proud he was of him. And the little kid just, he fell in love with that. And he, so he played and he played and he played and his dad was at every game. And uh, his senior year, his team, uh, high school team, made it to the state championship game. And it was two weeks before the big game and he, his coach calls him over at practice. He says, son, I need to talk to you. He goes, what's up, coach? He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but your dad had a heart attack today and he didn't make it. And the young man hit his knees and started crying. And uh, you know, he get up and he asked the coach, he said, you, you think it would be all right if I go home today a little early? And the coach told him, man, this is just a game. Go home and take care of your mom and your, your dad and your daughter, your sisters, and just do whatever you got to do. Don't worry about football. And so the two weeks later, in that two weeks, the school had written an article on his dad and how he was at every game and how he always told him he loved him and how proud he was of him, all this stuff. And it was kind of a big deal, and they dedicated the season to his dad. And, you know, the night of the big game, the kid didn't show up until about the third quarter. And when he showed up, his team was behind. And, you know, it's like a Rudy movie, a Disney movie. He runs out on the field, and he asked the coach if he could play. And the coach said no. And finally, the coach puts him in the game. And the kid intercepts the ball and runs it back for a touchdown. And he tells him to stay in there. And it gets down to the last play of the game, and his team's down by three points. And uh, the other team's punting it. And their guy's going to have to run it back for a touchdown to win the game. And they hike the ball, and the young man runs in, blocks the punt runs it in for a touchdown and wins the game. And, uh, you know, everybody jumps on him, and it is a Disney movie. And uh, it's just a big moment. And uh, that night when the coach is leaving to lock up the locker room, he sees a young man sitting in the corner. And he walks over, and he goes, you know, take as long as you want, I understand. And the young man says, thanks. And as he walks away, the coach turns around and goes, hey, I need to ask you something. And he goes, what's that? And he goes, man, you're the worst athlete I've ever coached. You know what I mean? You can't catch. You can't throw. You're the slowest. The only reason we keep you on the team is because you're a good kid. What happened out there tonight? And the young man said, well, coach, I don't know if you know this, but after my dad had never missed a game since I was in Pop Warner football. And after every game, my dad would find me, and he'd hug me and tell me he loved me and he was proud of me. Even the games you didn't play me or the ones I stayed on the sidelines or the games I lost, he always did that to me. And uh, the coach is standing. He goes, man, that's a good man. He goes, yeah. And the young man says, coach, what you don't know is my dad was blind. And today's the first game he ever really got to see me play. And right then, when I read that, I realized something, that every time I walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I see a new guy in my home group, and I walk up to him, and I shake his hand, and say, my name's Jason, I haven't seen you here for, before. Can I sit by and talk to you? Or if I come to a meeting, and I say, my name's Jason Johnson, I'm an alcoholic, my grandma gets to see that. My grandma's seen everything I've done in recovery. What a gift. Yeah, I know, and because of the relationship, you know, my, my prayers this morning when I get up, the first thing I do is I get on my knees, and I say, my dear friend, if you see fit and to be thy will, I sure appreciate it if I could stay in Alcoholics Anonymous just one more day. And I get up and I try to be the best member of Alcoholics Anonymous I can. You know, and you've built me a relationship with the God of my understanding. That I know today that when I die and I go to that big meeting in the sky, I know who's going to be out there in the parking lot. It's going to be my grandparents. You know what I mean? My, my grandpa's probably going to be sitting there like I'm always late. You know what I mean? He's gonna, he'll probably wave at me because he doesn't think I know where I'm going. You know what I mean? And, 
and I know what's going to happen. I'll walk up to him, and he'll probably rub his face like this and say something like, I didn't think you were going to make it. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I'm going to hug him and tell him I love him and tell him thank you for giving me a safe place to live. But my grandma, my grandma on the other hand, I, I, I can close my eyes, I can smell her. She's going to have her hands in the air, and she's probably going to be dancing. She's got to be praising Jesus and thanking God and telling my grandpa, I told you so. You know what I mean? But I'm going to hug her with everything I have, and I know what she's going to do. She's going to tell me she loves me, and then she's going to kiss me right on the lips because that's what grandmas do. <laughs> and then she's going to tell me she's proud of me. You know what I mean? And here's the thing. Because of what you people have done for me, I'm able to tell her grandma the damnedest thing. Some drunks and alcoholics anonymous have found a solution to their problem, and they showed me a little bit of grace. And in doing that, they introduced me to that guy inside of here that only you knew existed. I owe that to you guys. So if you're sitting in here today or you're, you're in recovery and somebody's telling you your life has no meaning, no value, or no purpose, they're telling you you're a piece of shit and you're not going to amount to nothing, do me a favor. Look them in the eye and tell them to go screw themselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because here's the thing. Everybody's life has value, meaning, and purpose. You know, I was in the airport one day and I saw a sign with Albert Einstein on it. It said, the two most important days of your life, the day you were born and the day you realize why. The reason why today is to love the unlovable and to show a little bit of grace to someone else. Thanks.